So Charlie, what, uh, where do you see as far as the products, right? Forget the science for a second. Let's talk about commercialization. First step, where do we go? How do you, how do you bring this into industry? Once it's proven in space, the first industry you have to, I think we would want to attack would be the uh, satellite industry. Station keeping, um, attitude control, low Earth orbit, low Earth orbit to, to lunar orbit. Why? What does Exodus bring to the table? Well, propellant propulsion is what the Exodus brings to the table. So what, does so that bring, what does that mean to me? What that means to you is we can get to the moon in two hours without fuel. We can get to Mars five days without fuel. It means we can get to the lunar surface without making contact with the lunar surface if you don't want to. It means a lot. It's easy, it's to travel, it's safe to travel. How would this impact the satellite industry? Well, right now, about 85% of, of a typical satellite is the fuel to keep the satellite in position, in service, and doing its job. So 15% of the mass of the satellite is roughly making you money. And once the satellite runs out of its station keeping fuel, that's it. It's a paperweight. It falls out of the sky or you have to command it out of the sky. If you could flip that around to where 85% of the satellite's mass is, is there making you money or doing science or whatever it is that the satellite's up there to do, and 15% is overhead and stay in space and the logistics of keeping you there, and that 15% never runs out, you've just fourfolded your ability to do science or make money or whatever it is that that satellite's up there to do. That's what we bring to the table. We can flip the usage ratios in favor of the capitalistic side, you know, or the, the side that, that does science longer and better and smarter. Got it. A wise man once said that uh, space is hard. I think you'd all agree with that, right? It takes a lot of money. You're talking about a big shift to get to where you want to be. Let's bring this closer to home. How does this affect uh, John and Joe Q, taxpayer? How does this affect your family, say, five, ten years? Where does this actually make a difference here in everyday life? What does Exodus bring to the table? Well, I think the <clears throat> in the short term, you know, Reinventing the satellite industry has a lot of applications. You could lower your cable bills, you could lower your, your phone bills, you could lower your internet access, ease your internet access. It can um, probably make space transportation for humans far more viable once we're up there. Um, there are unlimited applications once you're in space. Planes, trains, and automobiles. Someday, um, you can go back 100 years. Steam engines, um, all kinds of different combustion engines, um, horses to some degree, maybe 125 years. Today, everything's internal combustion engine or turbofan engines or some variation of theme, electric engines with uh, a, a power cell of some kind. So you have electric motors. Fast forward 25 years, 30 years, when the technology is fully embraced and fully capitalized on. Now you're Flying your your the Jetsons flying car is, is is now a thing running off the energy in your cell phone the um, Hover taxi is a thing the um, Ambulance that can fly down into a ravine and 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 save someone Down at the bottom of some ravine or something that they would never be able to get to they'd have to chop her in a, a rescue team now you can just hover down to them get the person save them um, uh, everyday things like uh, wheelchairs could become hover chairs. Um, things like um, elevators would become ho hover elevators. You, you wouldn't have the energy expended on the simplest of tasks. You know, the, the energy it takes to run an escalator or the energy it takes to run an elevator. Um, all of these things could be replaced with devices that are 10 to 1,000 times more efficient. And all of that savings, the, the, the car, the internal combustion engine, I think it burns up 25% of the engine of the fuel on the planet. All of that can be replaced with something that's zero emission, zero pollution. And this is true zero emission, true zero pollution. You're not just polluting someplace over here and then transmitting the energy over here and then using it. This is so efficient 
a propulsion system, so efficient a way to move matter and to, to accelerate matter and decelerate matter and to, to pump water, that you are truly gaining on the energy usage curve. You're not just burning energy over here and feeling good about it because you don't burn it in your backyard. You're not burning it in anybody's backyard. You're not burning fossil fuels at all. So I hear you on the, the Hoover Are we cars ready? and uh, yeah. Hoover cars and flying cars and that's that's all one great and wonderful. And I hear you on aerospace too. I'd love to have a lower cable bill and, and more Wi Fi bandwidth, right? Give me something more practical. What is what is more tangible that Exodus can bring to the table within the next five to ten years. It can put a relay station above every every town. You could put a small, what today would be considered a geosynchronous satellite. You could put a little relay station, a communication relay station above every town, at say a hundred miles up, just fl for just floating, just hanging out. You could communicate up with laser, communicate back down with laser, or or microwaves up and down. So then you could link the whole world, and maybe. You wouldn't have to put 100,000 satellites up there. You wouldn't have to clutter the Earth's orbit. So you could change the way that the services are provided. You could change the way that cell phones communicate. You could put a station over every town, and there would be no place that didn't have cell communication. If we get above Unity, you could go from here to the other side of the world in minutes, not hours. Easily. You just live straight up fly through space, you come back down. Every day, you can live in Florida and work in China if you want to. Yeah. That would, tr you know, would completely transform the it's, transportation system. It's not just a better gasoline engine. See, most people, the, 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 today the Tesla is a really great example. You can get in one of these things, and I, I, I've never been in one, but you can get in one, hit the button, and the thing accelerates and scares you for whatever it is, three, four, five, six, ten seconds and you have a massive acceleration. But then you have to stop because you know, you're, you're going too fast. It, but let's say you didn't have to stop accelerating. Let's say you could get in your little private space transportation device and you could accelerate not quite at, 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 at a terrifying rate, but let's say you could accelerate at, at a third of a G or a tenth of a G, but you could do that for five minutes. You're doing, you're doing 10,000 miles an hour. Well, 10,000 miles an hour puts anywhere on the earth in your, in your range of transportation. And you get to the halfway point, and you, you would have to figure it out, your ship then decelerates. And all of a sudden, you're decelerating, and you're back down to a speed that you can just, you know, land in somebody's front yard and get out of your, your transport craft. That's what continuous acceleration buys you, is the speeds are insane. You know, a, a trip to the, the moon, you could hit 100,000 miles an hour. A trip to Mars, you could be doing 4 million miles an hour for a couple of hours. You wouldn't feel it. All you feel is a constant acceleration, which is the same thing as what you're feeling right now sitting in these chairs. You're feeling a constant acceleration. You don't feel like you're pinned back against the chair. Or you're, you, know, you, you just don't feel those things. It would be a gentle, constant acceleration that you never have to turn off the engines. Sure. It's a new force. Use it to colonize the solar system in our own lifetime. We don't have to wait for our kids' kids' kids to do it. It's the middle of the afternoon on a weekday. What's keeping us from getting there? Say six months to a year. Funding, the opportunity to work, and all the different possibilities that exist. The theory is sound, but it's not specific. So we want to attack all the different venues that could exist. One of them will hit. I don't know when, but one of them will. And when it does, we're off to the races and we're off and running. The engineering is sound, but it's very rudimentary. Um, there's a lot of permeations that could move us forward in, in, a, in, a, in a positive direction, but you don't know which one they are. And I, I, you know, I, I do a lot of the engineering, so I do a lot of the manufacture, and you build something and it doesn't work. And then you build something and it doesn't work, and you build something and it works a little bit, so you have to follow that path. All of these things require the two things that are generally not available to um, the, the researcher, and that's time and money. If we had the time and money to spend on this task every day, all day, which we would because we're basically compulsive people, 
then the rate at which we would move forward would accelerate. Um, I, I, I think a, a good example is years ago, what about five years ago, we were doing a test a month. We would figure out something, it'd take about a month to, to build it and come together and right here in this, in this, in this uh, area, we would test it. And then when we'd go our separate ways and another month would pass and then we would try to get together. As the years rolled by, that, gain, that, that, that rate of change um, got down to about once a week. We did once a week testing for what, two years maybe. And then the, the, the testing switched into vacuum, uh, vacuum operations. And they, I got it down to once every two or three days. Um, now it's about once every four hours. I can go from a concept prototype to a testable test article in four to six hours. But that's that, under. But that's single path. That's, that's one true path. doing a single path. The idea would be to do multiple paths, like a research team would do. And you'd have separate groups doing attacking separate different possible engineering solutions that are not all necessarily related at all. That would be the key to accelerating us to the finish line. Drew's path might be the right one, but we don't know. We have to keep trying the other paths. And that'll take more researchers, more vacuum chambers, more science, more, more folks. Getting funding for uh, R&D is always a challenge, right? So pulling R&D aside, what can you do today? What would be a commercial product today that somebody could buy just where the technology is at today? Station keeping? No, and, and it could be an eccentric billionaire who wants to, uh, you know, who's losing in the moon race and uh, just suddenly decided he wanted to have the winning team. Uh, or it could be something as simple as a, uh, an upstart uh, satellite company. Uh, what can be done today? Without any additional research, just build the product and sell it. Yeah, I mean, I think we do have thrusters that are you know, high vacuum compatibility um, that can be operational in space for quite a while because we use space materials to make these. For so, example, a typical, typical satellite that you see getting thrown up in the sky all the time right now, a communication satellite. They use something called a, a little hall thruster, or a um, little ion thruster. They put out 60 millinewtons of thrust, there's four or five of them on a, on a typical satellite, and they, they, they last about six months and then you run out of fuel. We have an exact replica of that. We could put five of our little things on there and put out 100 millinewtons of thrust in each one. And they could just, literally, they could take out the thruster that's currently there and put our thruster in. Drop-in replacement. We would save them 50, 50 kilograms of weight on the on the space without ground. additional R and D. With no R, from right now we could turn, we could start production on a hundred millinewton thruster. That would be a drop-in replacement for the current accepted standard propulsion system. Um, the problem is one: we don't have a production operation. And two, our little prototype hasn't gone into space and been tested in actual space. We test in high vacuum. We test in the same vacuum that space is operating in. So we, we don't test in air. We test in the vacuum of space. But we have not been in space. And until you've been in space, you're, not, you're just not considered real for some reasons that are beyond me. Well, it makes sense. I mean, we are doing seems like to be the impossible so I wouldn't you know I don't doubt the hesitation for investment and in, in people dropping millions of dollars per front porch because it is so abstract mm -hmm. and it's very hard for humans to comprehend the notion that an object can move from here to here without shooting something out the back that's understandable because we've had 400 years of that physics which we're turning on its head with this. So it's gonna take time. It's gonna take proof. It's gonna take people building these things in their own garage, just as the lifters did 20 years ago, for people to believe it. What's nice about this technology is it's cheap, it's simple, it can be tested safely, if you know what you're doing with high voltage. But at least the concepts can be uh, self-taught to make people believe it. So 
researchers can teach their students how to do it, and that word will spread, and spread quickly. That's what's going to have to probably happen. It's another parallel path, but it'll make people believe it. We are fortunate that we can make thrusters out of styrofoam and copper tape, as you see there in front of you, so that everyone can do it. We are fortunate that we don't need a large particle accelerator to see this force that no one has access to. This is something that can be done in a garage, like, like we are here in my garage. <laughs> so, Yeah, I mean, you can go down to your local Home Depot, pick up some styrofoam, and order some copper tape off of um, you know, whatever, eBay or something, and you could put one of these things together in an afternoon. And following the patent. Following the patent and, and, and a couple of the videos that I think we're, we're putting out. Um, but what you're rewarded with isn't, is you're not going to get a Mattel hoverboard. Okay, you're not going to go skipping across water or anything. What you're going to get is a, is, a, is a thing that you put as a block of foam that you hang from a string and it's going to slowly move under its own volition if, if, you, if the air is calm enough. That's what you can currently build right now from the, the commercially available materials. We can take it a step further. We can build a much more advanced version of that, much more compact version of it, that puts out, say, 100 millinewtons, 50 millinewtons, 100 millinewtons, something in that range. That's still an amazingly small amount of force. But you never have to turn it off. If you never have to turn it off, it actually is of value to people who have a demand for force, even small units of force, over a long period of time. Space explorers. Yeah, space is a, is a low-hanging fruit for us. Um, one, because we both know the field. Um, I'm sure there, there might be others. I mean, there might be something in the medical community. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't do medical stuff. But it, it doesn't matter. If, if our technology gets out there and some doctor who, who needs a, 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 a peristaltic pump or something, because, you know, our, our system can pump water. We could build a, a machine that pumped microfluids. Um, we could build a machine that, that, that maybe um, oscillated or something, like a little watch. And you know, the, 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 the concept is, is scalable from small to large. Um, we know space. That's why we're focused on this as our first target. Because um, we know the technology. We know the, the, we know the, the, the players in the game. And we know that our materials are compatible with the environment that they're going into. But that's not to say somebody won't come along and say, hey, this would make a great, you know, wow, this is, this is the exact solution to some other thing that we don't even know about that we're like, sure, yeah, we can do that. You know, that's what, that's what exposure gains us. That's why we're, we're doing stuff like this, to try to get the word out that, you know, we've got the product. We have a product. We can make a product. And, and we just don't have a, a, the ultimate application for it yet. You guys, thank you for taking the time today. Very interesting discussion. So. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, Troy.